Uh, Professor Haldin, can you still hear me? Yes. Okay, so would it be okay if uh, we have uh, a Q&A session post your uh, talk? Sure. So the way we plan to go with it is, uh, go ahead with it is that uh, the participants would be writing in their queries in the chat session and mm -hmm. a filtered proper subset of the same would be put up to you by me, post your talk for your uh, uh, response. Will that be okay? Okay, what are the time constraints? Uh, there are none actually. It okay, all depends well, on how busy you are. Uh, okay. But we're not going to we not we not be pushing it uh, to very long after your talk. So maybe about twenty odd minutes post your talk. Will that work? No, I mean, what are the time constraints on the talk? Uh, usually, uh, we uh, it's about an hour long talk and about 20, 25 minutes of QA. But uh, it's entirely up to the speaker. Per okay. se, there are no constraints. It's entirely up to you. So um, I think uh, we're all set. We can uh, we can start. Uh, was it okay, Professor Alding? Should we start? Yep. Okay. Very good. All right. So. Um, Once again, uh, a very good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening to everybody uh, from where, whichever part of the world we are logging in today. And we are so delighted and honored to have our distinguished speaker, Professor Frederick Duncan Michael Haldane with us as uh, the speaker in the Mysteries of the Universe uh, Institute lecture series over at uh, oh, the Indian Institute of Technology, Roorkee, IIT Roorkee in India. Um, so Professor Haldane is the Sherman Fairchild University Professor of Physics at Princeton. He's known for a wide variety of fundamental contributions to kinetic matter physics, including the theory of luttingal liquids, one-dimensional spin chains, exclusion statistics, entanglement spectra, and being a, a, a big uh, fan of geometry, this is something I think starting 2011, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, uh, he's been involved in, uh, in, in giving a, a geometric description of the fractional quantum Hall effect, wherein, when, uh, wherein P, uh, he works with a, a, a so-called a unimodular spatial metric field, and uh, which provides the collected degrees of freedom. And uh, yeah, I think uh, it's essentially referred to as a Chern-Simons, as a combination of Chern-Simons theory and quantum geometry. He has a huge list of awards and honors to his credit, some of which include uh, He's, uh, he was elected a fellow of the Royal Society in 1996, uh, a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 1992, a fellow of the American Physical Society in 1986, a fellow of the Institute of Physics in 1996, a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science in 2001. Uh, he was elected as a member of the US National Academy of Sciences in 2017. He was awarded the Oliver E. Buckley Prize of the American Physical Society in 93 the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation Research uh, Fellowship in the period 84 through 88. Uh, he was a Lorenz Chair in 2008. He was a co-recipient of the Dirac Medal uh, in 2012. Uh, he was the Lisa Meitner Distinguished Lecturer in 2017. Uh, he was awarded the Golden Plate. Uh, the gold, he got the Golden Plate Award of the American Academy of Achievement in 2017 and uh, with David Taulis and Michael Kostrelitz in 2016, he was a co-recipient of the Nobel <coughs> Physics for uh, theoretical discoveries of topological phase transitions and topological phases of matter. So uh, with those uh, uh, few words, I would humbly request Professor Haldane to please deliver his lecture. Professor Haldane. Thank you, thank you, it's a pleasure. Uh, so uh, today I'm gonna tell you a little bit about some Kind of interesting new developments in quantum mechanics um, that have got a lot of people excited. You've probably heard about all the dreams of quantum computers that uh, people are dreaming up and uh, there seems to be quite a lot of, of progress at least towards trying to realize uh, quantum computing. Uh, so one of the interesting ideas which emerged in the last uh, probably last 20 years or so is the idea that we could uh, have use uh, topological states of quantum matter, a very exotic new kind of state uh, to protect quantum computing from the 
disruption by the, the by the vacuum by by fluctuations which um, entangle the the quantum information with the environment and lose it. So I'll talk a little, first uh, start with a little bit about quantum mechanics. Let's see if this is working. Ah, oops, got some technical. So the, the modern laws of quantum mechanics go back to the, the period of 25 to, um, oops, sorry, 25 to 32. And that was the first quantum revolution where the, the laws of quantum mechanics were discovered. And really the laws of quantum mechanics haven't changed. What was discovered in 1925 to 32 has stood the test of time. And quantum mechanics is a very uh, strange theory in many ways. And people have spent a lot of time worrying about it. But all the, all the tests of quantum mechanics to date have shown it's correct. And um, we have to accept that we live in a universe which is where the basic principle of physics is quantum mechanics. But just because we know the laws of quantum mechanics doesn't mean we immediately know all the amazing things that quantum mechanics allows to happen. And that's really what's going on now. We're discovering the new, ki new kinds of things that quantum mechanics makes possible. So, as I say, it's talk well, if you look at the history of physics, Maxwell uh, found the laws of electromagnetism uh, in 1864, and there's a, um, famous uh, quote that the prime minister of the day, Gladstone, I think he was the uh, chancellor at the time, asked Maxwell, this is all very good, but what is all this, what's it used for? What, what use is it? And Maxwell is supposed to have said, I can't tell you, but one day, sir, you may tax it. And of course, it's built up, the laws of electromagnetism have, uh, have given us all today's technology, really. And um, it took a long time to really discover the possibilities of electromagnetism and they're still being discovered. There's still new things like photonic crystals being, uh, being discovered. So quantum mechanics has also had a long history and uh, it's taking its time to discover all the things it can do. <clears throat> so starting around 1980, um, sort of new, new, newer things started to emerge uh, in uh, and unexpected topological quantum states of matter started to be discovered. And in condensed matter physics, this was one advance. But then on the other hand, there's been a large amount of advance in, in quantum information theory. And this is something that Feynman started thinking about in the late 50s. He worried about what would happen when you make uh, computers down to the atomic scale, very small scale where you have to use quantum mechanics. And he thought of quantum computers as, as ways to try to compute properties of quantum mechanics. Um, but these two, these two uh, different trends have come together now and uh, people are now trying to find how to control quantum mechanics and, and, uh, and really how you can control quantum states and manipulate them gently rather than just do a measurement and destroy the quantum states. And all this has led to what people now think is a, is a coming second quantum revolution, basically a hundred years after the first one, uh, where we're going to start to uh, deepen our understanding of quantum mechanics and, and, and hopefully have new technologies based on quantum mechanics uh, coming to fruition. So the key message well, given this talk that as we understand the quantum mechanics better, new and strange possibilities for the materials of the future and the technologies they will allow are emerging. And this new understanding has been emerging in a series of unexpected discoveries that have led to new ways to think about quantum materials. So you've probably seen this, but classical information is uh, stored in a bit, which is basically a switch can be, which is either on and off, up or down, one or zero. And it's often realized 
in a in a magnetic recording device. It's a it's a little group of magnetic spins that either point one way or the other way to give you up or down for the the, the switch. But in quantum mechanics, the information is stored not in a, a large assembly of spins that all point the same way, but in a single spin or what's called a qubit. And in fact, any system with just two states, like the, elect like the spin of the electron up or down is actually equivalent to a qubit. And the nice representation of the spin is the spin can point in any direction on the so-called block sphere. And the state of a single qubit or single spin is parameterized by a direction on this surface of the three-dimensional unit sphere. Uh, and so there's a lot more uh, structure than just up or down because it can be pointing left or right or in any direction on the, on the sphere. Uh, so there's more information that can be stored in this uh, quantum spin, but uh, you can only measure one direction of the spin at the time. So you can't uh, get full information. So anyway, we'll see that. So the central theme in, in the new approaches to quantum mechanics seems to be this property of entanglement. So entanglement was something that was a, actually Einstein pointed it out as the property of quantum mechanics because he thought it was so crazy that uh, quantum mechanics had to be wrong because it predicts entanglement. Uh, but it's now, uh, for a long time, it was a philosophical issue. You know, people, the philosophy of quantum mechanics, can it be, can you really describe nature this way? And what is entanglement? But now entanglement has moved to the front of our um, discussions. And it's now viewed as the fuel to drive possible future quantum information processes. So entanglement, is the kind of new feature that's really emphasized in quantum mechanics these days. And when I learned quantum mechanics, entanglement was something that practical physicists didn't worry about. It was a, a kind of philosophical issue, but now it's, it's become a, a practical issue. So Einstein, uh, of course, got his Nobel Prize, not for relativity, but actually for uh, his uh, early advances in quantum mechanics, where he, the photoelectric effect, um, which he explained. But by 1935 or so, he'd, um, he'd come to reject the quantum theory. He felt it, it had to be uh, just some approximation to some more fundamental theory uh, that had local real, uh, locality and local realism built into it. And so he came up with this property of entanglement, which he famously called spooky actions at a distance, um, or spookhafte Fernwicklung in German. Um, but Schrodinger came up with uh, this term that we now use entanglement in the English language. Actually, it's a word that has a, uh, every language seems to have a, a, an unrelated word for entanglement. Uh, but it, okay. So when we, what is entanglement? In fact, entanglement is everywhere on the atomic scale. The, uh, the fundamental, one of the fundamental properties of quantum mechanics is the Pauli exclusion principle, which says that two fermions, two electrons can't be in the same state. Now, in addition to the position, the, the state of an electron has an, an additional uh, degree of freedom the direction of its spin, which is analogous to a spinning top. And the chemical bond is actually made of two electrons with exactly opposite directions of their spin, which allows them to occupy the same region of space in between the two atoms, which they form a chemical bond between. So the, the entanglement is fundamentally there in the in the chemical bond which holds us all together which all all uh, condensed matter is really made of and the the chemical bond the spin half the singlet spin singlet state of two electrons is a maximally entangled state where as i say if electron one has its spin pointing up electron two has to have the spin pointing down but it could be 
left and right. It has whatever the spin of one direction of one spin, the other spin in the chemical bond is pointing in the opposite direction. So Einstein worried about this. What would happen if I took the pair of electrons in the chemical bond and stretched it? And would they remain entangled when they're very far apart? Because the, the feature of entanglement that worried him was that if I measure the direction of one of the particles spin and, it, and I find it pointing up, the other particle will always be point, found to be pointing down. But until you do that measurement, the particles can be pointing in any direction so long as each one is, has its spin pointing in the opposite direction to the other one. And Einstein felt that, I think he felt there was a, a violation of, of the causality principle of relativity, which was of course dear to his heart, that if I, he worried about if this, uh, if this uh, entangled pair of spins was separated so the two components were large distances from each other and you did a measurement on one, how did that, inf was there some violation of causality that information traveled instantaneously? Uh, of course, we now know from a deeper analysis of this thing, there's no violation of causality involved because there's no actual information transfer, transported by doing the measurement. Um, but anyway, Einstein didn't like the idea that the, the directions of the spins were not fixed until you did the measurement. And um, he proposed this uh, paradox. He, he, he uh, proposed the Einstein Podolsky with Podolsky and Rosen. He proposed uh, this paradox that uh, again, if you separate this, uh, this correlated pair of, of, of particles with their spins in a singlet state, uh, could, would it really, would you really be able to, uh, to, 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 to see this entanglement by doing measurements when they're a long distance away? Of course, it's actually very difficult uh, and it was very impossible at the time he proposed this to, to separate entangled particles. And of course, well, the big goal in most of these new measurements in quantum mechanics and experiments is to try and produce entanglement between particles which are, uh, which are at least mesoscopically distant from each other. They're not, on they, they, re they remain entangled when they have uh, distances between them, which is larger than the atomic scale distances. So, uh, uh, it took some time, and uh, after Einstein proposed and Podolsky and Rosen proposed this, uh, uh, their paradox, the idea that, uh, you know, it, it seemed crazy that things could be entangled over large distances. Uh, Bohm, uh, David Bohm, and then later John, John Bell made a, a deeper analysis of Einstein's uh, paradox and uh, proposed a, a firmer kind of uh, experimental tests. And these experimental tests were carried out in the early 80s. Uh, one person associated with this is the, the French uh, physicist, Alan Aspey, who, who basically uh, showed uh, that Bell's, arg uh, Bell's arguments and showed that, uh, that uh, the measurements were not, you could make were not compatible with Einstein's uh, simple interpretation of classical physics and, and were fundamentally quantum. So the experiments really uh, showed that Einstein was wrong in the set to challenge uh, quantum mechanics. But Einstein, uh, people talk about Einstein's greatest mistake. Einstein thought his greatest mistake was uh, um, the vacuum energy, which we now believe is related to the dark energy, which is pushing the universe apart. But Einstein's mistakes have always been very fruitful. <laughs> and even though he thought he was proposing a, a way to kill quantum mechanics as a theory, the entanglement that he pointed out is that is now really thought to be the fundamental property of quantum mechanics. Okay. 
So the experiments on this uh, um, didn't involve particles with spin. It, any quantum system with two states forms a qubit. And uh, a much better kind of system to work with is polarization of light because the photon can occur in, can has two possible states, either left up or down, up, down or right, left for horizontal and vertical polarization or better circular polarization uh, in, around the direct clockwise or anti-clockwise around the direction the light is propagating in. And now we know that uh, using optical fibers, you can separate, allow photons to travel large distances after being entangled and remain entangled. And in fact, uh, last year or so, uh, the uh, Chinese uh, group reported entanglement um, between uh, objects on the ground and, and a satellite in orbit using photons. So, so that's the history of, of entanglement. Uh, in 1980, when I started working on this problem, condensed matter uh, physicists thought they had a basic understanding of electric and of electronic and magnetic materials. Uh, but each time we think we have a basic understanding, some new experiment comes along to show us that there's a lot of stuff we don't understand. And the beauty of a subject like condensed matter physics is that experiments are always coming out which will give, show you unexpected things which were more remarkable than, than what you dreamed up. So anyway, around 1980, there were basically two examples of weird properties showed up. Uh, they didn't seem to be related at the time, but now we know they're both uh, properties of a new kind of condensed matter, which we now call topological quantum matter, where quantum entanglement really plays a key role. And they were unexpected at the time because no one at the time really thought that entanglement had any real importance in, in, in physical properties. Okay. Okay. And so these two examples of topological matter didn't seem, to be, uh, didn't seem to be obviously related to each other when they emerged. But in the meantime, the connections have been found and many, many more kinds of topological matter have been discovered in the last, uh, in the last decade or so. And there's a lot of excitement in this whole area. Okay, so the unexpected properties of this topological quantum matter, uh, of course, they, uh, the most exciting aspect of it is that they led to a proposed platform for topologically protected quantum computing that could, in principle, avoid the decoherence uh, that, gen that typically destroys entanglement between systems which are <clears throat> in contact with the environment. Okay. And of course, uh, the Nobel Prize, which I and uh, my colleagues received, the basically the subject became interesting because it had been, uh, people had seen that there was a possibility that they could be used for quantum computing. And, uh, and that's really fueled a huge amount of excitement in this area. <clears throat> so what's topological, uh, topo topological matter? So topological matter is different from ordinary matter because it has entanglement properties that can be described by whole numbers, integers like minus one or two or minus five. Okay? So states of matter which are classified by whole numbers can't smoothly change into each other. So in addition, there has to be something interesting at the boundary between different regions of different topological type. Because again, because the, the integer can't change continuously from one to two or whatever, there has to be some boundary region which is different where the, the change happens. So ordinary matter might be described by boring numbers like zero or uh, or one, and uh, interesting matter could be classified by other numbers like other integers or 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 plus or or plus or minus for the zero and one. Okay, so 
Oops, let's see. So the basic uh, thing is that topological properties of matter can't change continuously. So one consequence of that is that the properties are robust against small amount of dirt. If things can't change continuously, that you have to do a finite amount of, of, of work or, or do a finite amount of disruption to something to change it. And that actually makes, that's the, the key to the possible uses of, of topological materials because of this stability. So a little bit of dirt, a lot of dirt will destroy the topological property, but a little bit of dirt won't. And that's in contrast to the high, the, the, the highly clean, the ultra clean systems we need to make today's computing technology based on silicon. A little bit of dust on the silicon wafer will, uh, will ruin it. So you see all these people in the, in the chip fabs uh, dressed up in these space suits. And of course, the space suits or these uh, clean suit in the clean rooms are not there to protect the workers from the any kind of na the nasty chemicals that might be involved in making the silicon wafers. They protect the silicon wafers from little pieces of dust that came off that come off the people. So, what is the classic example of topology? The classical example in mathematics is the classification of closed surfaces by the number of holes in them, or the genus. And the example that everyone talks about in connection with topology is the difference between uh, a football and uh, a donut, or a, and how a donut is equivalent to a coffee cup. So that's basically a shape such as a sphere has zero holes. And you can easily take a, a a football and change it into a rugby ball shape by squeezing it. But you need to do a, a, a large amount of violence to actually poke a hole through the system and turn it into from a, a ball with no holes to a, a donut shape with a hole down the middle. And the basic principle is holes come in whole numbers. There's no such thing as 0.36 of a hole. You've either got zero holes or one hole and something, there was some event that happened when the, chain, when the change in the number of holes in the system occurred. So this comes down to this, this great mathematical discovery of Gauss, okay, the, uh, the Gauss-Bonnet theorem. So Gauss uh, looked at the formula, you probably remember the formula for the surface area of a sphere. The surface area of a sphere is 4 pi r squared, where r is the radius. Oops. And um, the sphere is curved. It's got uniform curvature. And the measure of the curvature is the so-called Gaussian curvature, which is the product of the two radii of curvature on the surface. And basically, they're the, the two radii are the same uh, on a sphere. So the curvature, Gaussian curvature is one over R squared. And so if I integrate the curvature over the surface, the surface area is four pi R squared and I multiply it by one over R squared, then I get four pi. Um, but what Gauss discovered and shocked him tremendously was that uh, if I take this integral of the curvature and I squeeze my surface, I, I make it not a, not a simple uniform sphere, but uh, either a rugby ball or a banana or something, some more complicated shape, where it's much more difficult to do this integral, you'll still find that once you've summed up the curvature on all parts of the surface, the total will add up to four pi if it's got no holes. And if it's got one hole in it, it'll add up to exactly zero. And if it's got two holes in it, it'll act add up to exactly minus four pi. So this was a, a, an invariant of the system, which was very uh, stable against uh, changing the geometry of the system, provided I didn't do change the geometry in such a fundamental way by, by making a hole in it. And so this is the connection between 
geometry, which is a curvature, which is a local property on the surface, and the global property, which I if I integrate the curvature all over the surface, then it's a closed surface, I will find four pi times a number, which is going to tell me how many holes there are. Okay. And uh, if I take this classic example, I'll see that the, the coffee cup, uh, which is equivalent to the bagel, uh, a donut, um, if you look at the donut carefully, you'll see that on the outer part of the surface, uh, if, I, if this is working, it's, on the outer part of the surface, uh, the two radii of curvature both, both have a, a center the inside the surface. Um, but if I go a point at the inside part here, I'll find one radi what the cer one circle is centered in the middle of the hole, which is outside the, the donut, and the other circle um, in the other direction is centered inside it. So the two radii point in opposite directions and you have negative curvature at that point. So the, on, the, on the donut, there are equal areas of positive and negative curvature, which exactly balance out. And once I make more holes, I get more negative curvature, regions of negative curvature associated with the hole, and I get this, this number. So here is the, uh, so we see this, this is a, uh, an interesting object, it's called a loving cup. Um, and it's got two handles, which is equivalent to this object, which has two holes in it. Um, at the Nobel press conference, uh, this, this is a call it, this is a non-existent object called a Swedish pretzel, but the real pretzel, the German pretzel is one with three holes in it. And here's this interesting object, which I'm not quite sure what it's called, but I've heard it suggested it's a California loving cup with three handles anyway. So what's this got to do with quantum physics? Well, in 1944, the mathematician Chern took this, uh, this rather concrete formula of Gauss's, which applies to real surfaces, curvatures on real surfaces, um, which you can make you know, in, 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 a, in a Euclidean space, and made it a much more abstract mathematical formula, which applies to the quantum problem. So instead of discussing a, the real curvature of a physical surface, um, Chern came up with generalized a formula to describe a much more abstract mathematical curvature on an abstract surface. And it turns out that Chern's formula turned out to be the, the essential feature that opened up some of these, uh, these, new, these new things in topology and quantum mechanics. So the surfaces involved are not physical surfaces with a curvature uh, that you can make a donut or a coffee cup, but they're a mathematical curvature, a property of quantum mechanics um, on a manifold, a continuum on a mathematical manifold of states which describe uh, a set of quantum states. So it's, in recent years, it was realized that uh, this quantum condensed matter can exhibit unexpected properties associated with long range quantum entanglement. So in, the, in this quantum context, entanglement means that if, I, if something is entangled, it, it means if I do a measurement in this part of the system, if it's not entangled, a measurement made in this part of the system will not affect the outcome of a measurement made in the other part of the system. Uh, clearly, near the boundary, a measurement made very close to the boundary of this side will affect, kind of, can affect something just on the other side of the boundary. But if I do measurements far away from points, the, the, st the state here is really independent of the state in this side of the system. And that means that if I actually cut the system in half and separated it, I could view the, the large system as just a simple product of two independent systems, the left and right part, and which are not entangled whatsoever. So the state of this system here, this part of the system is really unrelated to the state in the other side. 
And uh, so a measurement made on one side will not affect the state on the other side. On the other hand, the topological property materials have this property that they have a, uh, an interior region which is topologically distinct from the outer region outside it. And they have to have a boundary between the two, which has some interesting properties where the, the system changes from topologically non-trivial to trivial. If I try to cut the system in half, as I did for the trivial entanglement, it turns out it's more tricky, but the, there's basically entanglement between the two sides of the system. If I manage to cut it in half, I will find that these edge states that occur everywhere around it will now, once it does break into two, will have uh, edges which the edge state will now continue on the, the part of the edge, uh, which is the new edge, which has been opened by cutting it. And this edge state really is in some sense uh, necessarily there because something has to terminate, when you break the entanglement, something has to terminate the, the broken entanglement at the boundary and that's the, these edge states. So uh, in some sense, we can, we can think of the topologically topological quantum states as having their properties because of entanglement issues. So topologically trivial states of matter can in principle be uh, made by assembling them by bringing the atoms together and all the atom, all the electrons remain bound to the individual atoms during the process. But topologically non-trivial states, as I bring the atoms close together, some change has to happen at a definite point along the, the path of bringing them together. And uh, that as, as the matter is assembled atom by atom, as, they, as the atoms come close, the electronic state has to change in a, in a fundamental way. And basically the bound electrons which are bound to the atoms are liberated and maybe rebound in a different pattern in a state with non-trivial entanglement. And if I actually look at really old work, I mean, these, these, these uh, observations were there a long time ago, but it's only in, in recent years that the idea of, that the idea of bringing all this, all this disparate kind of uh, examples together and seeing a, a, a genuine a, a principle involved has happened. So if I take, uh, if I do a calculation involving a simple toy model of uh, a, a crystal, uh, which actually was done way back in 1939 by Shockley. Amazingly, I guess the electronic computers were not available at that point. So this is all done with hand calculators and rooms full of secretaries cranking out calculations. Uh, if I try to solve this toy model and bring the atoms together, when the atoms are widely separated, the energy levels are just the energy levels of each atom. And this toy model has S levels, P, it's, only got, it's a one dimensional model, so it only has even and odd parity states. But as I bring them together, the energy levels start to split, but you get to a definite point where they seem to touch. And when they go past this point, when you've brought the atoms closer together, there's been a fundamental rearrangement and I get left with these edge states, these two, the, the energy bands are separated, but there is exactly one state associated with each of the two edges of the sample. And uh, it's a very interesting example because if I populate these energy levels, I can put one electron in each level uh, when I get to the edge, uh, the edge state can accommodate, uh, if, I, if I kept the same number of electrons as I had when I started in the free atoms, the, 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 the Fermi level, the, the separation, the energy between the highest occupied and lowest empty state will actually have to be trapped in this tiny little region here. If I drop the Fermi level below that, I've got, I've lost, one electron, and if I push it above there, I've gained one electron. But these states are one state at each end of the sample. So actually what you see here, if I, if I in this region, there's half an electron at each side of the sample, <coughs> is, is missing at each side of the sample. And if I 
put the chemical potential here, there's, there's half an electron extra at each side of the sample. So you start to see interesting things like local charges becoming different from the standard quantization of charge you expect. You can half, half an electron can be localized at some point. And in this example, this uh, uh, system is, uh, what's uh, driving this system is uh, um, uh, inversion symmetry, it turns out. Uh, it's not explained here. Let's see. Oops. Let's go backwards. Yeah. Um, but this is actually the a precursor to, I think, what you'll learn about in a, in a, in a future lecture um, by, uh, by Kane. Charlie Kane is on, on the list of lecturers for this thing. And he'll talk about topological insulators. This is a this is a, this is perhaps the simplest example of, of a topological transition as I bring the atoms together. So uh, fractionalization to get half an electron sitting at the edge of the sample is uh, uh, somewhat surprising. Uh, but in fact, in, in these condensed matter systems, we can start to get interesting systems like that. For example, if I have a a, a one-dimensional chain of particles, electrons in a kind of who've kind of crystallized in the sense that uh, every at, every second atom has one has an extra has an electron, and every 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 atom either is has an electron or not. And so the, there's one electron for every two lattice sites, and they repel each other. Then if I remove one of these things from the pattern. I, I leave an empty state here, but I can now let this extra, this region has minus one electron, but it can, I can now split this thing up by moving the pattern around and now you can see that half an electron can travel. So this is a typical thing we actually find in topological states of matter that we'll see that um, unexpected quantum numbers like uh, that carry half an electron charge or a third of an electron charge will occur. So in heavier atoms, the, my, my original contribution to this is as follows, that in heavier atoms, uh, the electron ha has a spin, which was conventionally called spin a half, because that's angular momentum is a half h bar. Uh, and in heavier atoms, the spins become locked together, uh, so they come parallel. And this is often one of the sources of magnetism. And so the, the, the atomic spin will actually be uh, 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 an integer number of a half. So it's either a whole number or half a whole number by, by definition. And so if they're all lined up, uh, classically, it's just a, like a little magnet that's pointing in some direction. But it turned out there was an important difference between whether there was an even or an odd number of of, of fundamental spins lined up in these spins. Something could either be a integer spin where there was a even number of spins in it or a half integer spin when there was an odd number of, of, of fundamental spins. So the total spin in this group is either an integer or a half an integer. And that's a quantum property and it's topological. So in a conventional magnet, uh, magnetic ground states, they have long, the, mag, the, the, the local ma magnets, atomic scale magnets like to line up along some direction. And they all point in the same direction if you're a ferromagnet. Um, so that's the kind of magnet that will pick up a paper clip. Uh, but there's another way they can line up. They can still choose a definite direction if they want to point not parallel to their neighbors, but every, every spin likes to be pointing in the opposite direction to its neighbor. So if you do that, uh, every second spin will be pointing in the same direction when it's happy and the, the ones in between will be pointing in the opposite direction. So this system is called an antiferromagnet. And at low temperatures, just as at low temperatures, you cool a iron down, 
when it gets below the Curie temperature, it, uh, it magnetizes spontaneously and you see it picking up paper clips. The antiferromagnet will do something similar, but you won't notice it. So it's not so obvious because it doesn't pick up paper clips. But the transition to an ordered state in an antiferromagnet happens at low temperatures. And, uh, but this is an interesting state with long range order, but there's no entanglement between these objects. I could build this ferromagnet up by, by bringing a load of magnetically polarized atoms and putting them, lining them up next to each other. And I could line them up with the spins alternately up and down along some direction here. So these are totally unentangled states, even though they're interesting magnetic states with magnetic order. Oops. Oops. Some problem here. Okay, and backwards. So what I discovered back in 1981, when I was a postdoc, uh, I discovered that spin one, as opposed to spin half states of matter, of, of magnets could have an unusual state. And uh, it turned out to be the first of these uh, topological states which emerged. And it was quite a, it was quite shocking at the time because no one had thought about anything other than um, the magnetic order that could happen in these magnetic systems. So the conventional idea of the antiferromagnet with spin one would be that you line these, these, these objects, which have two elementary spins in them, line them up, up, down, up, down, up, down. And again, there's no entanglement between these uh, state, between the atoms here. Uh, but it turned out the unexpected state would basically comes about in some sense, even though you've glued these two spins together to make a power, to make a spin one object, in some way they can uh, they can re split and they can split in such a way they can uh, form a singlet bond. One half of the spin can form a bond with half of this spin and form a kind of uh, like a, an analog of a chemical bond along the system. And of course, when you get to the end of the chain, it's got one of these things is left over. So you've got a free spin half. So even though these were spins with unit one, and the thing was completely built out of spin one objects. When you join them up in this way that entangles them across the chain, you get left with something at the end of the chain. And this is very typical that there's something unusual at the boundary between the topological state here and a non-topological non region outside the end of the chain. Something happened at the boundary. And here you have this half a fractionalization of the of the magnetic spin here. Half of the spin is left over at each end of the chain. So again, nowadays looking at this picture, which was not the original picture, uh, is kind of an obvious thing. But uh, this was actually very shocking in the whole magnetism community at the time, and it provoked a lot of controversy. Um, and uh, and it was uh, basically people had talked themselves into, a, into an incorrect picture of the system because some, uh, there, was other, there was other evidence that really would turn out to be irrelevant evidence that, that, that thought justified uh, the, the previous picture. But in science, in the end, questions have to be decided by experiment. And What's happened these days is theorists can come up with toy models, like the toy model of the spin chain I showed, but material scientists are now able to actually make the, the theorist toy model a reality by building molecules to do things. So what was done at the time, a spin one chain was made out of nickel atoms in an organic compound called NEMP. And, uh, when the measurements were done, the prediction was that this state here, the, the original state, um, let's go back, oops. Going forward in way. Yeah, so the interesting thing about the, the spin chain is here in the, 
in the magnetic state, uh, you can cause the spins to wiggle. So this thing supports spin waves, kind of like sound waves. You shake them a bit and the spins can point, can, can rotate a little bit away from the direction they want to point in and a fluctuation of a wave can travel down the chain. And it's like a sound wave almost. Well, in this case, the system is kind of rigid. It can't be excited unless you break one of these bonds and it costs some kind of energy to do that. So the unexpected feature was here that this system has a, a unique ground state uh, and an energy gap to cause any, any energy flows or anything to flow in the interior of the system. You have to do enough work to break a bond. Again, it's topologically stable. So the only place I can excite this thing is by, uh, let it, I, can, I can cause the, the free spins that live at the end of the chain to wiggle around and they can be excited here, but the interior is a, a, a quantum state with an energy gap protecting it against being excited. Well, I can excite the magnetic system here by wiggling it and I can, I can, I can add arbitrarily small amounts of energy to the interior of the sample. So this is actually an example of these topological states. Uh, and in fact, experimentally, it was discovered that it was, it was shown that in fact, uh, that the predictions were correct. Okay. And this, this simple example turned out to have the controversy around it, um, you know, it was a challenge. It was a challenge for experimentalists and a lot of experimental techniques uh, grew out of this thing and material science measurements. But in fact, a lot of theoretical ideas were, 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 were thrown at this problem to try and uh, prove or disprove the original prediction. And uh, a lot of the uh, important uh, techniques such as what something called matrix product states and the, um, uh, the density matrix renormalization group and techniques which are used for big calculations these days actually were created as part of the, during the period where people were trying to to prove or disprove these, these original ideas. So the, the basic picture is actually now occurs in a number of other situations, but the, the simple way to think about it is um, the, the, the spins are entangled in some way. And if I have a line of people who are entangled by holding hands, uh, you might say that uh, Generally, unless someone's been injured, uh, ha hands come in pairs. So there are two hands, two, two hands come with one person. But in some sense, if, they, if the people have joined up and link hands, then there's one hand left over at the left hand of this chain of people and another, another free hand left over at the right hand of the system. And so I can somehow, I've separated I've broken the rule that hands come in pairs by physically separating the, 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 a pair of hands over a large distance. And that's something like the uh, separation of entanglement. Okay. So in fact, in this Nobel prize I got, they put a picture of this spin chain. Uh, in fact, uh, the, uh, the, a toy model which, which came after my spin chain, but uh, much of work, but it was, was actually featured on the Nobel certificate. Okay. So soon after this, this uh, discovery of a topological state of spins, which was very unexpected, some of the uh, essential ingredients started to emerge theoretically to understand it. So in particular, uh, Michael Berry discovered something called the Berry phase. And that's a very uh, cute part of quantum mechanics. And it hadn't been noticed really uh, as a principle before Berry, although it was floating around in all kinds of calculations, but no one put the ideas together to, uh, to, 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 see as a, to see it as a principle. Basically, if I take, if I, um, if I, if I, continuously change a quantum state and uh, bring it back 
to its original form, a quantum state is ambiguous up to a phase. So you can't measure the phase, you can only measure the relative phase of two quantum states, you can compare them. Um, but if I continuously change a quantum state in a, in a continuous fashion and bring it back to the original state, the phase, the undetermined phase of the system, of the system can change, right? Uh, so what Berry discovered was that if I have a spin and it like the like the qubit spin and it's pointing in some direction and I move it around the closed path. So on the, a path of the direction of spin is a closed circle on the surface of the sphere. Then the phase change of the wave function turns out to be geometrically related to the area enclosed on the surface of the sphere by the path of the head of the spin. But the area of a sphere is four pi. And if I, if I said that the phase is the um, area inside this circle, I could have said it could, be, it could be minus the area outside and the other part of the sphere, which differs by four pi. Uh, so the, the phase is actually only um, defined through an exponential property. It's not, it's the exponential of the phase that's, uh, the phase factor that's invariant. And the answer is that it turns out that the, the phase you get is the solid angle subtended by the path, the air on the surface of the sphere, times, um, times the spin. And since the spin is either integer or half integer, that's okay because the area here is ambiguous by an amount of four pi but four pi s is e to the two pi i, which is one, if s is an integer or a half integer. And so this is actually turns out to be an example of a topological invariant. Um, okay. So where did this come about? So the quantum hole fluids, the other discovery which happened around 1980 was the discovery by von Klitzing of the quantum hole effect. And uh, right, yeah. So the quantum Hall effect is a, something that happens where you have very strong magnetic fields and the electrons are confined to a surface. A surface, either the surface of a crystal or a layer inside a crystal, which is what they did at the time they built a, a quantum well. And uh, the basic property is that von Klissing discovered is that if I measure the so-called hole with hole resistance or the hole conductance of the system, I do a measurement of some electrical measurement. And the answer turned out to be fundamental constants, E squared over H times a whole number. So instead of getting a straight line, as you'd expect in a classical theory, at low temperatures, the straight line suddenly develop lots of little plateaus and they all take exact values given by this. So it's of course a remarkable thing that a physical measurement on a dirty system produces essentially a whole number times fundamental constants. And again, this is because this is a topological property and E squared over H is part of the fine structure constant. The fine structure constant is the ratio of this number um, or the multiple is, is this number, which is a uh, one over 20, uh, 23,000 ohms. Uh, and if you multiply it by the, by the vacuum impedance 5, 577 ohms, you get the fine structure constant. So this is actually a very fundamental part of physics, the quantum of conductance. And the whole system of units, which has now replaced the kilogram in Paris is now being based on, on the quantum Hall effect. So this was, of course, led very quickly to a Nobel Prize for von Klitzing, and it's had tremendous impact because of the of many things. But in particular, for example, the, the system of weight, the system of units, is now totally based on this topological property. So in the magnetic field, the electrons go around in little circles. But if I um, and because they're doing periodic motion. The, uh, the, freak, the energy of the, of the states is quantized in units of Planck's constant times the frequency of the orbit. 
So the energy levels of the electron in a magnetic field take, into, take discrete values, which depend on, on, on how many quanta there are of uh, excitation in the, in the lambda orbit here. So if I put all the electrons in the lowest states, so I can, I can center these orbits at different places. So there's lots of different orbits and they all have the same energy. So basically if I fill these, this region up here, uh, I find there's one, um, there's one state for every unit of magnetic quantum, quantum unit of magnetic flux through the system. And so this gives you a special density where if these states are filled and all the other states are empty, I will get a gap and I get, I would naively expect this quantum Hall effect. <clears throat> but uh, the key that makes this topological is that if I change the system a little bit, I still stay in this state where the interior region only states in the lower band are filled and only states in the upper band are empty. And that's because there's edge states in the system. And the, at the edge of the system, if the electrons are going around little orbits, when they hit the edge, they can't continue and make a little circle. So they hit the edge and they will bounce and they will go, if the orbit is clockwise, then the bouncing orbit around the edge will be anti-clockwise because it'd be a set of little clockwise partial orbits which bounce back off the edge. So it turned out that you get edge states at the edge of these quantum Hall systems. And that's of course a typical example of, of topology. <clears throat> and uh, the edge states are related to the gap in the bulk. And uh, this is somehow underlying why you have this, this number. <clears throat> so the colleague who got the Nobel prize at the same time was David Thaulis. And he got it for this, work or other work, but including this work here, that uh, they tried to understand why, why, the, uh, why the quantum Hall effect was quantized. <clears throat> a naive picture with a clean system will allow it to be quantized, but a real system has dirt in it. And the whole issue is why, why, the, why topology is stable against dirt. So to model dirt, which is rather difficult, they made a, a simplified model. They replaced the dirt by having a, uh, oops, um, oops, I lost my thing. Having a periodic potential rather than just a random dirty potential inside the system. And periodic potentials are something that, that theorists can do calculations on. So it was a kind of tractable toy model, even though it, the real system is dirty rather than periodic. And uh, they, found a, they found a formula that forced this whole conductance to, to be exactly an integer. So they, they wrote down this formula and they, and they, as an integral, and they did this integral, and they found out it always had to be an integer. And it turned out that uh, a mathematical physicist, physicist had heard about Thales's result. And he also heard about um, uh, Berry's results. And from the Berry's results for the Berry phase of the spin going around the circle, you can turn that into a curvature. And it turned out that the Thales's formula was exactly the, churn, the Churn's mathematized version of the gauss bonnet formula. It was a formula that related um, uh, a, an integral of an abstract curvature, the Berry curvature, rather than the physical curvature of, of the surface, over a, over a donut, although the donut was now a mathematical structure, the so-called Brouwen zone of a two-dimensional electron band, but it was exactly the same formula in this more abstract sense. And so that was a, that's a connection to uh, topology. So it was a, a quantum version of the topology that Gauss discovered relating physical surfaces and their curvature to the number of holes in it, which is an integer. So Berry's phase really has led, uh, has really blossomed. It's led to very, very extremely fruitful and it's led to a whole lot of discoveries in, in topological quantum materials. Okay. <clears throat> So one issue with the 
uh, quantum Hall effect was it requires very strong magnetic fields. And initially it wasn't obvious that, uh, you know, it was, you could do without magnetic fields. Um, but it turns out that uh, the, key as the key ingredient is not, um, not so much the magnetic field, but the fact that something has broken time reversal symmetry, which means any, any magnetic system breaks time reversal symmetry. But the key thing was that this quantum Hall system had edge states that go around the edge of the sample in one particular direction, okay? So clearly the properties of the sample uh, are not, would look different if I took a movie of it and I showed it backwards in time. Things go around in one way only. And indeed that was the, cr the crucial thing. And in fact, one now finds that you can make uh, that the same physics can occur in crystalline matter without magnetic fields, just as a consequence of magnetism. And uh, so this actually is the first of what we now call the topological insulators. And uh, again, this remarkable property, uh, let's see if I can find it, is as follows. It, the simplest example, which was given in the original work was to uh, was involved something which is now very familiar called graphene. Graphene hadn't been discovered at that time, so it was a theorist material. Um, and this is a variation on graphene where I put, I break time reversal in some way. And it turns out graphene has, if I cut graphene sample, oops, if I cut a graphene sample, if looking at the edge of it, if it's one, if it's if it's got something called a zigzag edge, this kind of shape, you find that if I look at the band structure of it, there is some there is an edge state which lives um, in in a in a region of the edge between an image of the Dirac points, these beautiful points in graphene. Uh, uh, the images on the edge. Uh, you, you have this edge state here. Uh, if I now break time reversal symmetry or spatial inversion symmetry in the graphene, um, the gap has to open between these bands that touch at the famous Dirac points. So if the gap opens, the edge state, which is connecting these two touching points has to either, it has to make a decision which way to go. Right? It's got to be stick to either the upper band or the lower band when the gap opens. And in the boring case, which is a, a just a, where it's just broken inversion symmetry, the, the, get, the state is either attached to the here, to both, both ends are attached to the upper band or both ends attached to the lower band. But in the interesting case, one end attaches to the upper band and the other is lower band, and they form a kind of pipe. So quantum states that I change the magnetic field can flow between the upper band and the lower band through this, this edge state. And that's exactly what you see in a quantum Hall effect. And this, this thing exhibits a quantum Hall effect, even though it doesn't have a magnetic field on it. And uh, this was a long time coming, this, uh, this, this, this predicted toy model. It took until 2013 to, to make systems that did this, that would show this quantum Hall effect just for magnetism, but without a huge magnetic field. And in between the discoveries of Charlie Kane and co uh, happened, which basically generalized the original work to um, do it. So the, this property of edge states that go around in one way is something which may have a, a lot of practical importance, we hope, because uh, think about traffic on the roads. The traffic on the road works well because the road is separated, the cars go one way on one side of the road and the other way on the other side of the road. So if it's a much more organized transport than if there was no rule of the road and uh, cars were just choosing where to go, um, one side or the other side, as in which happens in a, in a regular material. So this kind of idea that topological states at the edge can be used for something is probably quite interesting. And in fact, it's now been shown to happen in photonic systems with photons. Okay, so this is what you're gonna hear about. So a, a tremendous amount of interesting stuff came out of this. Uh, let me just skip through. 
But where's the quantum computing come out of the thing? So the integer Hall effect was discovered by, was followed by a, a much, uh, another discovery, uh, in some sense, a much bigger puzzle, the fractional quantum Hall effect. Uh, and again, that led to a Nobel Prize, but for Bob Loftin and, and Stormer and Stewie who discovered it. And again, this, this device, the device in which the thing was studied was discovered is this rather messy looking object here. And it's because there's a topological property underlying is underlying the, the, the this uh, fractional Hall effect that you can, um, that, it, that it's immune to, it doesn't require ultra cleanliness, right? You can see it in this kind of, in devices which are uh, imperfect like this one. So quantum, fractional quantum Hall effect has all kinds of weird stuff in it. Uh, this a, uh, has particles with fractional charge and edge states. And the interesting thing was if I move these particles around each other, uh, if I exchange a pair, I get phases which are different from a plus one phase I would get for exchanging a pair of bosons and a minus one phase I would get exchanging a pair of fermions. So these things are called fractional statistics. So the, this case is a rather boring kind of fractional statistics in the sense that the only thing that changes when I move the excitations around each other is the um, uh, phase of the system. But let me move through a lot of the thing. But a more remarkable kind of quantum, fractional quantum Hall states uh, emerged from this. These ones are called abelian. There was a, another kind which are called non-abelian which can actually hide as I move, part of, move the elementary excitations around each other, they change uh, underlying, there's underlying degrees of freedom in the system which can hide quantum information. So these are the things which were hopefully going to give us quantum computing. And you may have seen, uh, if you've seen any of this stuff, the pictures of braiding that you can basically uh, the, the qubits are made in this system, theoretically uh, associated with the positions of the uh, various excitations and by moving them around each other actually change your process information that's stored in the entanglement patterns in this system. Okay, so, so it's again been a long time coming to do experiment, get experimental verification of a lot of these interesting ideas, but very recently, um, this year, there's been the abelian fractional statistics of the fractional whole state seem to have been verified in various interference experiments done, uh, reported this year. And of course, we still need to, to move on to the place where we can do the, qu the quantum information. So in this system, the non-abelian case, I move these, um, it's again a quantum fluid, uh, this fractional quantum Hall effect with edge states, and these are little vortices or the excitations in the fluid. And uh, the important thing is that there is uh, information stored. The, these objects have to be created in pairs. And information is in the system is uh, is, a, is stored in an entanglement pattern, which represents the, which contains the history of how these things were created. So in these non-abelian fluids, um, these basic objects, which are like half vortices, can locally be created, only a two of them can be created at a local point. And if you pull them apart, they leave a kind of trail, they, the history of how they were created is left in an entanglement pattern, which is somehow localized between the pair of these objects, which were made by pulling a, a double object apart. So in this uh, system, four of these objects actually is enough to form a qubit. So if, if I have these four objects, which are at the same place, I don't know how they were created. So they could actually have a pattern which entangles this pair with that pair, or it could entangle that pair with that pair. That would be an up state of the qubit of, on, the, on the block sphere, and the other one would be a horizontal state, it turns out, of the qubit. And if I 
put the thing around it. So there's a hidden quantum information, which I can't see by just looking at where the vortices are. It seems to me that those two systems are identical, but no, there's an extra hidden piece of information in them. And because it's hidden, it's not going to be affected by the environment, which is where the protection comes from. Okay. And in fact, when there's a calculation on these things, you can see that this is an example of the, the, the two states of the qubit I showed there. This four, there were four of these objects. Uh, and the, you can each of these objects turns out to have one, uh, uh, one quarter of an electron associated with them. Uh, so they look superficially the same, but if you look very carefully in some properties of these states, they're very, very tiny little interference patterns on the, on the, in between the things which tell you whether the qubit, whether you're pointing, your qubit is pointing up or down. But the difference between these things is exponentially small. And as I make the system, the, 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 the quasi particles get further apart from each other, the, you can't you can't tell the difference, which is when which is why the information that's hidden in the quantum state is protected. Okay, so I guess I'm running out of time, but uh, the remarkable these remarkable properties have emerged bit by bit from early beginnings, and uh, really no one dreamt of before all this was discovered. Dreamt that quantum mechanics allowed all these very interesting possibilities of storing and hiding information and manipulating it. And so the beautiful dream of topological quant protected quantum computing using these kind of topological qubits is intellectually satisfying in the sense that it, 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 if it could be made to work, it would be scalable. The problem is uh, no one's actually managed to get one of these qubits to work yet. So it's still a theoretical uh, uh, issue. I believe that if it's, I believe that if braiding can be demonstrated, that's certainly going to be a Nobel Prize, for example, for somebody, right? And um, it's a remarkable, uh, remarkable idea, and it, it, it's coming to fruition. Uh, now, of course, fusion as the solution, fusion as the energy source of the future has been a remarkable uh, possibility that's been waiting to happen for the last 50 years or so. So it's not so, so beautiful dreams don't necessarily come to fruition. Um, but I personally believe that the topological quantum states is a remarkable feature that's going to lead to, to new technologies. So, um, so I be so one of the practical proposals which for this, which hasn't really worked out yet, is um, not the quantum Hall states, which uh, require the fractional ones have only been found in very high magnetic fields so far. But if we can find them without a magnetic field in magnetic systems, that would be that would be great, right? Um, the toy model that people have been working with and using experimentally is actually something called the Kitaev model of superconducting wire. And basically it has a feature that you have a, a, a toy model with a one dimensional superconductor. And one remarkable thing in, in these things is an electron state. Um, each of these atomic orbitals is an, a, can contain one electron. So it's an electron state. It's a spinless superconductor. Uh, the superconductor allows, in some sense, the electron to lose its charge and split into two parts. So just as a spin one could split into two spin halves, at least um, could be frac fractionalized and half of it could join one side and the other side. It turns out, at least mathematically, you can separate the electron state into two parts called Majoranas, which are in individually half an electron state. And the uh, principle which people are working with for the superconducting wire turns out to be almost exactly the same principle as the one I talked about earlier of the people lining hands. The, the electron orbitals 
uh, a split into two Majorana orbitals, red and green. But then they join up again to form new electron orbitals that like this red one joins with, this half electron orbital joins up with this half electron orbital here. And what it happens, that leaves you half of the electron state at either end of the chain. And this is the so-called Majorana zero mode that would, was these objects which, in it, which if we could move them in two dimensions was what I showed uh, the objects which were braided around with each other, right? So again, the same fractionalization principle essentially is of taking something, splitting it up and joining things together in a slightly different way, leaving half an object leaving half an object on one side that's spatially separated from the other half object on the other side of the system. Once you can create these objects which are spatially separated, there's an entanglement link connecting the two. And if you can move these things around in, in, in a two dimensional space, then that's where you're manipulating the information. So anyway, that's, this is the approach which the people at Microsoft have been trying uh, there's lots of other approaches to quantum computing which don't involve topology, which seem to be uh, progressing much faster these days. But scalability is the big problem. The holy grail is, is, is uh, to find a scalable system. And um, again, I don't know what will emerge, but I think we're learning lots of new things about quantum mechanics, and I'm sure we're going to have a lot of interesting new stuff coming out during this second quantum revolution. And when looking at the thing, what makes all this thing work is, is a comp there's three kinds of, at least three kinds of people involved in the thing. Some of the original work, at least in my work, for example, came in this toy model building, making simplified models, which are simple enough to actually understand in detail and expose unexpected possibilities in the physics. Underlying any such unexpected possibilities that emerge has to be the deep mathematical principles like the, the like uh, Berry curvature and the gauss bonnet chern theorem. And to bring all this thing to reality, to have it not just a, a theorist's uh, talking shop, is actually material scientists have to, have to be able to make materials that perhaps build the toys, the toy models into, into real life. And What's been happening these days is this, this whole, these different things have been coming together and uh, it's different languages taught, talked in, spoken in each of these different areas, but it's been quite a interesting ride. Okay, so basically that's it. I guess I have one point I'd like to make as a, for the student audiences. So a, a lot of these discoveries were unexpected. When I discovered this thing about the spin chains, I stumbled onto it because it wasn't a, uh, it was an unexpected thing, but I was following some earlier work I'd done. Von Klitzing's uh, was no, never expected to see the fractional quantum Hall effect because no one would have ever believed anything, or the integer Hall effect, no one would have believed such quantization could happen. It was like a complete shock. Uh, Various other things have been like that. And one of the important things in science is that uh, you actually don't know where you're going in science. And uh, my message is actually, uh, you need luck. But so basically anyone working in, basics, in basic science, you know, could stumble across uh, something unexpected, right? The unexpected things are there because uh, the, the really good things are unexpected and then they haven't been discovered yet because no one even imagines that they exist, right? So uh, everyone has some chance, I think, if you're doing basic research, you find something unusual. Most of the time, take a little bit of time just to try to understand what you found. Don't, if you're too occupied with a, uh, a straight line path, you might be walking along, kicking the dust, and you're, you, you're, you may have kicked up a, a massive diamond in the path as you, but if you walk on by without looking at what you've kicked up, you will just look, you will walk on by and not find it. So in many ways, you need to be, uh, you know, ready to, to follow up something unexpected 
and uh, you, if you're lucky enough to to wander around in the right area, you may come up, you may find these kind of things that no one expects to be there. And basically, what you need in science is a little bit of uh, curiosity to find out, to to see, to try and understand things that you might have, you may have stumbled across, and see what what's going on. And uh, basically, you need the preparation to see that you've found something interesting, of course, and you actually need a lot of commitment to basically, if you, if you do think you've found something interesting, to follow it through. And you'll, if it's anything that's really unexpected, you'll have to fight for it. And uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Haldane, and especially for the, the last slide. It was, uh, it was so beautiful. Thank you so much. Uh, maybe you all uh, unmute yourselves and uh, have a round of applause for Professor Haldane's beautiful lecture. Okay. So... <laughs> Uh, uh, Professor Haldi, will it be okay if uh, we have some questions now? Yes, sure. Very good. Okay. Um, okay, so let's see. So there's a question from uh, Sandeep Kumar Dash, uh, and the question is, uh, um, uh, does, no, sorry. So, uh, okay, there's, sorry, that's not. There's a question from Devmal Mukhopadhyay. The question is: Does the emission of radiation affect the entanglement of two electrons? Well, radiation can certainly uh, uh, decohere the electrons. Rather, right? the, the, if if one of the electron is, if you shine radiation on one of the electrons in the pair, then it will become entangled with the with the photon with the radiation and lose its entanglement with the other object so the basic problem with entanglement is the um, of the kind that Einstein was worried about is it's very it's very strong on the short distance scale a chemical bond is a is a very strong object it's got a, a large energy gap protecting it uh, against breaking which is of course you need to shine uh, light with a high enough frequency on it to break a chemical bond. Actually, that was, of course, uh, essentially what um, what Einstein discovered in the photoelectric effect, right? His original work on quantum mechanics that <clears throat> that was to 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 call to shoot an electron to knock an electron out of a metal, but to <clears throat> but um, the chemical bond has a large energy gap protecting it. And it's stable, but as I make the as I make the thing longer and longer, the energy gap protecting it gets gets very small, and the and the, the problem is a, a spatially separated uh, pair is very fragile, and so a little bit of interaction with the folk with light or radiation with one of the two partners will, can destroy the um, the entanglement between the two. So the long range entanglement has mainly been achieved with photons because uh, photons don't interact very much with much with anything, right? I mean, that's why we can see photons coming from the, from the Big Bang basically uh, have survived to reach us over billions of years. And when you send them through uh, fiber optic cables, high, high freak, then they, you can, initially the entanglement were, over distances were produced by sending the photons through fiber optic systems, right? But uh, so, um, but other people, some of the some of the devices people are making these these uh, transmon things is basically superconducting qubits and coupling them again using photonics is 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 important for the things for addressing them, right? Um, but yes, uh, interacting 
sh shining light on a, on an entangled on one member of an entangled pair is a way to to break the entanglement, and so you have to protect them, and that's why the the topological idea is at least intellectually satisfying because the information is not stored locally; it's stored somewhere in the region between these uh, these 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 Majorana zero modes, which I vaguely showed, and uh, since the information is non-locally, you could shoot a hole through the sample. If the information has been spread out, it, there's only an exponentially small chance that you will hit it by shooting a hole through the sample with a cosmic ray or a bullet or something. So if you could, the, the environment usually interacts locally with, uh, uh, with matter, right? So if the information is spread out, which these topological information in principle is, then uh, it, that's why it's immune. It's only to, of course, to you can process the information that in, in a protected way. To read the information in and read the information out, you have to bring it, you have to bring things close together again. And, and there's still danger in of loss of the loss of, of decoherence during the read in, read out process. But if the processing is done with everything well separated in principle, you can process a long, do a lot of a lot of processing before. While in the normal kind, what we're now working with, what the what the the leading contenders in the game are, the so-called noisy intermediate scale quantum computing, and you're not protected, and uh, basically you just have to hope that your calculation didn't get ruined. So you, in the current scheme of things, you would basically re repeat the calculation a number of times. And if you got the same answer, you could say, well, if, 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 a few sum, if a few times you got the same answer, you'd say that's the real answer. And I managed to, I managed to make the calculation work before decoherence set in. But the longer, longer the calculation is, the more, you know, you're eventually going to hit decoherence. So that's what the, the topological idea is, is, is aimed to try and solve. Okay, great. Uh, there's another question from uh, uh, the same person. And uh, the question is, does entanglement violate cluster decomposition property in QFT? Uh, I don't think so. I'm not sure really. Good question, yeah. Okay. Um, so there is a question. I would say the, the current ideas in, I mean, entanglement, of course, is the current ideas about black holes and uh, current ideas that the, the colleagues in, 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 in string theory are working on is basically the idea that the, the space time is held together by entanglement, right? It's just an, entanglement is now centri entanglement is now everywhere in the, in the quantum field in different areas, right? All right, yeah. Okay, uh, so the next question is by Akshat Mishra. And the question is, uh, often a bit of disorder in semiconductors enhances their properties by many folds. Such doping uh, would be of no use in topological materials, or would it? <clears throat> well, the doping in semiconductors is just to provide uh, um, mobile charges, right? Uh, essentially, the, 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 the topological states uh, are something like filled band states, except not uh, where the electron density is pinned to something. Uh, so, yeah, doping, I mean, in the in a quantum hole device, you you have, you create a two-dimensional layer in the sample, a quantum well, which can bind electrons, and uh, the electrons are put, uh, the electrons are placed in that layer by by doping the sample somewhere else, right? But the doping takes place. the The quantum hole samples were made by putting the doping layers well away from the place where the quantum 
the, the quantum fluid system was made. So you, you do want to avoid uh, too much, uh, inco uh, too much uh, random potentials because your, any kind of randomness in the sample has to be small, has to be small compared to the energy gap. Okay, so if I have a large variation of potential through the sample from doping, um, then I will, if my energy gap is, is, very, is small, which it is in these uh, experimental systems, then uh, it'll ruin things. So you need to, uh, you need to have a, a sample that's clean enough, that's homogeneous enough that uh, um, it doesn't ruin the gap locally. So what people have found as a promising alternative to the magnetic things now is these uh, twisted bilayer graphene where you get so-called flat bands uh, in, in, in two layers of graphene at a particular angle, so-called magic angle, and you can get some things. So a lot of the, the, the interesting topological states occur when the uh, interaction energy dominates the kinetic energy. So you have to have a, a very flat band so the kinetic energy of individual electrons is very small. It was basically zero or as, as it is in a, in a lambda level. Or, uh, and the non-trivial states occur when interactions between the particles dominate the, the one body uh, terms. So yeah, doping and stuff is, is only there for, with, the doping in the semiconductor is just to provide uh, some mobile charges, right? I can't hear, sorry. Oh, sorry, I, I was, uh, I, sorry, my mistake, I muted myself. Yeah. So, uh, so uh, there's a question by Abhijit Reddy and the question essentially is asking what role does gravity play in entanglement? Uh, none as far as I know, right? I mean, uh, uh, I guess um, the string theorists are trying to, uh, I guess, formulate uh, theories of black holes, right? And basically, there they're kind of talking about the quantum information paradox and uh, um, the essentially entanglement in those pictures because about when a particle drops into a black, the, the paradox was particles can drop into a black hole, but uh, Hawking and Bekenstein radiation, black hole can eventually evaporate, right? Now, of course, a, a regular black hole will never evaporate during the lifetime of many universes, but a tiny black hole in principle would evaporate, very small one. So the, the paradox of Bekenstein and Hawking and things of like throw stuff into a black hole uh, is the information lost, is quantum mechanics, is it a non-unitary evolution of time? So if stuff drops into a black hole, the Hawking proposal was, well, it's gone, right? The but if the black hole can evaporate, do you get the information back again? And the picture that people work on in, in, in string theory and black hole theory these days is that the information as a particle drops into the black hole, information that, that was carried by the particle gets left in entanglement somewhere on the event horizon of the black hole. So there's an entanglement. So if something drops into a black hole, there's some entanglement pattern that's left in the event horizon. And if it, this black hole was small enough that it eventually evaporates by Bekenstein Hawking radiation, the information gets released. The information was not lost. And when the, the hole evaporates and the, and the event horizon shrinks, the information that was stored in the event horizon is released again. So, so yeah, so the people who work in gravity theory, quantum gravity theory are, are very strongly interested in issues of entanglement these days. But that's a completely separate issue. That's a <coughs> a non a non-experimental, a kind of very formal 
thing. But of course, the picture there is that space time is somehow uh, built out of entanglement. Yeah. Towards, for example, entanglement between a pair of electrons rather than the entanglement of the radiation. Um, mm -hmm. That was part of the query. And I think there was a, there was a, a recent uh, a Nature article in 2020 on uh, having to do with uh, looking at the effects of gravity uh, on entanglement of uh, particles, probably spin, or I, I don't remember. Mm -hmm. I remember uh, coming ac across that article rather recently. And yes, I mean, of course, uh, the string theory community is uh, especially because of uh, this work on by Juan Maldacena uh, and company, um, um, having to do with these so-called islands uh, mm -hmm. in the pertaining to the resolution of the information paradox has been very, very helpful. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Uh, so there is a sweet little query by Arpita and the query is simply, what is AKLT? What do they stand for? Her? Affleck, Kennedy, Lee, Lieb and uh, Tas uh, Tasaki. Ah, okay. AKLT, uh, so that was the toy model of my my original spin chain uh, was I discovered the thing, but the the toy model of the AKLT toy model is a very very simple model that, that demonstrate that that incorporates that. It's a modified spin chain model that that make the state is very it, it makes us it makes the state very clear the the kind of um, the the nature this kind of nearest neighbor coupling of the of the spins. Basically, the pick. Basically, uh, it, it puts uh, it makes it very concrete the picture of, of splitting the spin in half and re and re and rejoining them in a different way. Uh, the, the 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 meme of the hands joining, right? So it's a very simple principle, actually. This, uh, as I say, you see it in the Kitaev chain too, which there you there in in the original one you you had a, a you had a chain of spin one objects. But they form an, an interesting topological state, and half half of half of a spin one object is left at one end of the chain, and the other half at the other end of the chain, which is spin half object. In the in the Marana model of Kitaev, which is the one which is underlying the, the quantum wires that they're trying to use at, at Microsoft, um, the electrons, an electron orbital. <laughs> Is somehow split into two half electron orbitals, right? Into new Majoranas. And then half of an electron state is labeled, is, is physically located at one end of the chain and another half at the other end of the chain. And these are the objects that if you could braid them around, um, the, they, the, the information is stored in the entanglement between these two objects, physically separated objects. So the, the key in all this thing is to is to produce non-trivial spatially separated objects which leave an entanglement trail between the two of them right and then if you have you've got if you've got more of them you can uh, you know store information in the entanglement pattern so in the in the superconducting wire model uh, obviously i think you want a two-dimensional system or a one-dimensional system but there was a there was proposed schemes for for braiding, which is a bit like moving trains on a toy train track and, and moving something in a junction to get things past each other. It's difficult to get, in one dimension, it's difficult to get to exchange objects without them getting close to each other, right? But then there were some schemes with like T junctions where you, you shut like train tracks and things, but none of that stuff has worked out so far. But uh, um, the people are looking for the right platform uh, for the topological states, and there's some indications that this this uh, twisted bilayer graphene system, which has very flat bands, <coughs> uh, has lots of interesting things in it. So people are people are very hopeful, right? But we haven't, but no, no there's no cu no qubit yet, right? It's all theory, but in um, the other the other the other kind of more standard quantum computing ideas based on iron traps and things. They're all building qubits and whatever. So we'll see. But anyway, quantum mechanics is quite, uh, 
these things are very unexpected properties of quantum mechanics. And so it's only, it take, it's taken a long time to really realize that such possibilities exist in quantum mechanics. And, uh, and, uh, I, and the whole idea of, of information processing is really the, somehow taken over these days for quantum systems. Okay, so we'll come to the, the last query and uh, that's from Deepan. And uh, the query is, does the inability of the edge electrons to exhibit space inversion, even at long orders, lead to a violation of the lenses law? Uh, um, I'm not sure what the question was really. Okay. Um, Maybe uh, Deepan is around. Uh, he could probably type in a little clarification very quickly though, that which means right away. Uh, let's see if... Um... Maybe not. Okay, I think uh, that's, that, that'll be it. So I think uh, let's... Uh, thank Professor Haldane for his incredible lecture and even more incredible patience with all the queries. And uh, thank you so much. It's a very cold Princeton morning, I'm sure. And uh, <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and um, uh, we are very grateful and very appreciate uh, your uh, willingness to, uh, to give us a beautiful talk. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure, my pleasure. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Bye. Be safe. Okay, folks. So with that, we come to the uh, the conclusion of uh, today's uh, lecture. And uh, as already uh, 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 very kindly mentioned by Professor Haldane, uh, we have uh, Charlie Kane, Professor Charles Kane. A month from now, it is a big gap because we have these national exams, pair of them, the so-called gate and jam for admission to the graduate programs in the country. So the next lecture is next month. I believe it's Feb 16th, if I'm not mistaken. So uh, see you all uh, uh, then and uh, please stay safe. And uh, we are all desperately waiting of course for the vaccines. So uh, that's how we all get vaccinated, a lot of us. Okay, thank you once again, Professor Haldane. Have a very good, Bye. good day. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, everybody. I'm closing the meeting now. I'm ending the meeting now. Okay, team, thanks a lot. I'm ending the meeting. Sure, Bye. sir. Bye-bye.